You're listening to the Study Clicks podcast, your number one source for junior and leaving cert tips. We make exams easier. Welcome back to the first episode of the Cyclix podcast of 2021. Um, myself and Emer are back again, um, but we're recording this a week ahead of the CAO deadline for 2021. So we decided to get a special guest on, an expert in the CAO and a career <laughs> guidance counsellor, uh, Mr. Donica Mahoney. Donica, welcome to the podcast again. Girls, thank you so much <laughs> for having me back again. I, I, I really enjoyed the last time. It was a lovely chat and I'm looking forward to this one too. That's great. Yeah, you are so well. I got such great feedback because the last podcast that we had you on, we recorded back in August, obviously ahead of the the results and they were the strangest or like the results like never before. So it was a very interesting chat. And again, the, the never ending leave insert 2020 and it still seems to be going on. Yeah. And, you know, no, no results till February now, you know, so it's I feel bad for that 2020 cohort and hopefully 2021 will be a bit more organized this year. We hope so. Yeah crazy time for all of us but um anything that we can do to make students feel a bit more reassured or give them the the answers to the questions that they that they have um Emer's here as well I feel like Emer should say something she hasn't spoken yet hi (laughs) so uh, hi everyone who's listening yeah it's um kind of your traditional podcast you still have me and Nessa your host but like Nessa said we have Donica here as well and you can also find Donica over at his original podcast uh Leaving Cert Guidance and also has a wonderful Instagram with plenty of career guidance tips to find. So definitely go check that out and give them a follow. Even if it's past the CAO date, you'll get lots of stuff there all year round to help you get through the uncertainty and confusion that tends to be the leaving cert. So, um, yeah, this this I suppose we had to preface this particular podcast saying that although it's about uh, filling out your CAO form and getting it in, uh, before the deadline, the original deadline is already passed, so many of you might have already filled out your CAO um, form at this point, but there's still plenty of tips and stuff in this podcast about how to fix it and amend it later on, and you'll still find plenty of valuable tips. So regardless of your CAO journey, keep tuning in. There'll be stuff for you on this podcast. Perfect. So um, we're going to start off with asking Donica the questions. We have actually done a CAO podcast before, but we are far from experts. So we're delighted to have Donica on to actually tell us. Yeah, we should delete that podcast. <laughs> it's shameful. Don't listen to it. Actually, I, did, I never brought it up. But um, the very <laughs> first question is, we'll just get as basic as possible, because I'm sure there are people out there, and especially now when people aren't in school. But Donica... How do you fill out the CAO form? How do you do that? Yeah, and, and it, I always try to say to students that it's actually okay if you don't know because this is your first time ever going through this. It's easy for me because I go through it every single year with students. So there's no reason why you should or shouldn't know it. Um, and if you do, it's absolutely fine. Just seek out some help if you don't know it. Um, but I suppose if you're really unsure, there's actually a CAO demo application that you can do and it's on the CAO website. So if you just even type into Google CAO demo application and you can try out a few different things and see what works and what doesn't work. Since it went online, CAO is more or less all online now. It's pretty hard to make a mistake. When I was doing my CAO, you literally had to get a CAO form, get the codes, write them out in pen. Sometimes the codes were wrong and you didn't get a choice for that. And you were wondering, God, I got the points. I wonder why I did because you had the wrong code down or something. No, no. But now, uh, if you put in a wrong code into the CEO, it comes up in big red letters that that's the wrong code or it'll come up beside of what the course is. So it's pretty hard to get wrong. It's a fairly easy system um, now. It used to be harder. So when I did it, 1st of February was the full deadline. That was it. You had to get it in by the 1st of February. You had to walk to the post office with your bank draft as well and post it off and, and uh, get, hand in your bank draft and all that. But now it's so much easier. Debit card, all online. Um, so it's like it's try the demo application if you're unsure but it's pretty easy it's it's very self-explanatory what you have to do but even Emer, what you were saying there that a lot of people might have their CEO form filled out most students by the 20th of uh, January all they have to do is open up the account get your CEO number uh, and that's it and actually the majority of students don't start filling out their any courses on their list until the change of mind facility opens up in May, June uh, I was chatting to 
Eileen Kelligan the other day from CEO, and she was saying you wouldn't believe the amount of students who leave their list blank until May, June, uh, and then they start getting courses in. Because she was her tip was kind of like, you know, get the, some courses down in February um, yeah. instead of leaving some, them. <laughs> some good name dropping there, Donica Eileen from the CEO <laughs> on the CEO podcast. It's as good as you get. <laughs> Um, that's interesting so you don't actually have to put in any I was under the impression that you had to put down something no you don't have to put down anything at all now if you're applying for a restricted course the 1st of February is the deadline um, so like restricted might be medicine because you're doing a HPAT test it might be music in case you have to do an audition uh, or drama it might be art or architecture if you have to do a portfolio some courses might have an interview or an extra application form like Adelaide uh, Nursing in Trinity College always have that extra form so you just have to really sure that you're not applying for a restricted course and if you're not you can leave a blank um, but if you are make sure and, and even if you're not sure about putting down a restricted course oh, I'm not sure if I want to do art in NCAD I'd say put it down anyway before the 1st of February because when the change of mind opens up you can always take it out mm. you can't add it back in but you can take it out so if you're not sure about restricted courses, just put them down anyway. Okay. And, and you mentioned the HPAT. We might come back to that later for anyone who's listening and is thinking of doing the HPAT. Um, but you, so you were saying there that both yourself and Eileen would recommend putting something down. A- aside from the restricted courses where there's the obvious benefit to putting it down, um, what would be any, the advantage otherwise? If you're just not sure yet, like what's what's the difference between putting something down now and waiting until May so what's very interesting is that by, before the end of May, you get sent out a statement of application from the CEO. Again, that used to come in the post, but last year, they obviously had to email it. And I think it's going to be emailed again this year. So what's on that statement of application is your leave and cert number, your date of birth. Uh, and then if you have put down courses, they're just saying, is this what you want to put down? Is that your leave and cert number? Is that your date of birth? Make sure everything is correct. Because if anything is wrong with it, you won't get your offers, even if you make the requirements. And it, you know, that's your job for the statement of application. That's the CEO saying to you, just check that we have all our details correct. Um, and if they're correct, fine, you don't have to get onto them at all. But if they're wrong, to get straight onto them. So I suppose that's kind of the only reason you might put a few down. Some people like to put them down and then not think about it until after the leaving cert is over. Uh, because you can still change after the leaving cert. Um, so it's like okay I don't have to think about that now until I'm finished hmm. then you might decide god the leaving cert went way better than I thought uh, I actually might put down this course I didn't think I was going to get um, is that why the change of mind is there actually is that how it came about yeah more or less because uh, it was kind of unfair like I was saying to you the 1st of February that was it done and dusted uh, I think you, you maybe could have paid extra to, to use the change of mind before now this is a long long time ago this isn't uh, recent since, since I did my leaving cert <laughs> Um, but yeah I'd say that's the reason is to, to give more people an opportunity to, to change their mind if needs be uh, Brilliant I might just touch a little bit on this on the change of mind even though we might actually do a, a, another podcast all about that When is it and does it cost anything? Yeah so it opens up on the 5th of May so the, the CEO more or less closes the 1st of February until the 5th of May and the reason for that is they want to get all those assessments done during that time and then the 5th of May opens back up right up until the 1st of July. It doesn't cost anything to do a change of mind. In fact, you can change your mind as many times as you like during that period. It's not like you only get one or two opportunities. You can take loads in and out, whatever you feel like. You can play around with it. So it's a really good time. And even the 1st of February to the 5th of May is a good time maybe to do some research uh, on different courses um, and maybe get them onto your list. So what can students do? Because I was looking at the CAO website earlier. And they have the different dates of their calendar and things. And they've mentioned something about after the 5th of February that you can amend it. What What's that about? Yeah. So the 5th of February um, until about the 1st of March, um, you can actually put on a restricted course, even though the 1st of February was the deadline. Now, it's going right. to cost you to put on that restricted course. And it's only 10 euro. Um, but it's just kind of if people forgot, okay. genuinely forgot. So that's just for restricted courses. It's not like you because I kind of thought there might be if yeah. I was reading that it's a bit vague on the website I thought if I was reading that and I thought okay I changed my mind from the, the applied languages course I put on I need to change that now after the fifth but it's, you're saying it's just the, the research one yeah 
it's just restricted because there'll be no need to change your mind between um, February and May because you you get the opportunity to do it after the fifth of May for free as well. Okay. So yeah, so the fifth of February to the first of March, if you wanted to get your restricted course down, or if you've had a change of heart or something, you, there's still an opportunity there to to get it done. Excellent. Okay. Uh, the next point I'll bring on to you, and I'd say it is your favorite thing to talk about, is the order of genuine preference. <laughs> Do you put down your dream course first, even though it seems out of reach? Yeah, I was saying to you guys before I came on that there was a Twitter comment that he must get sick of talking about <laughs> genuine order of preference. But bread no, and but, butter. Yeah, that's the bread and butter. But it is so important. Um, and if you don't know what genuine order of preference is, it's it's really, really important to get the courses down in the order that you want to be offered them. Uh, so it's kind of like, and I said it in the study clicks video uh, that we did during the summer, it's kind of like, forget about the points for the first few courses, uh, whatever your dream courses are. So I always say three dream courses, whatever you want to do, get them down number one, two, and three, whatever option you want them on. And then the next five courses, I always say, they should be your, your probable courses. I'm probably going to get these points to get, these courses and then your last two should always be your backup courses I always think and backup courses should be something like 100 150 points below what you generally get and um, just in case you don't know what would happen during the leaving cert you might not feel well or something might happen you might sleep out for an exam or something you just don't know so it's always good to have a backup option there and the reason for genuine order of preference is you can always go up on your CAO list but you can never go down on your CAO list so, for example, say you were offered your third choice from number four right down to number 10. They're gone off your list on the computer. You'll never be able to get those. So people who say, God, I, I actually would have preferred my fourth choice, but I put didn't put it down ahead of my third choice. You, you'll never get that course unless it comes onto available places. You won't get that course. Uh, so you can't get it. Now, you can always go up so you can be offered your second course or your first course in subsequent rounds. But you can never be offered. And the amount of kids every year who say, God, I'd have preferred my fifth place to my third place. I should have. So that's where the genuine order of preference comes in. Because you can't, even though you might have the points for your fifth place, doesn't matter. Uh, you can't be offered that because it's lower. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like in terms of motivating yourself and wanting to study and everything, it's just a good thing to put, even if you think it's unrealistic for yourself to put something that's maybe 100 points out of your usual point range if you have that on the top of your list and you're going you still have whatever four or five months to go it's great for motivating yourself because if you had never put it there in the first place you're like oh look i didn't even put on my list so i'm not going to try i'm just going to do what i usually do if you have it on your list and you're like okay well now it's actually a possibility so i'm going to try harder and you know i have it down now so i might as well try i think it that would definitely push me at least if if i had a goal to work towards and it would push me a lot further absolutely go for it Look, there is 10 places on your CEO form and you have the opportunity to fill those places, like the first couple of places. But like you were saying, there were courses that you thought were out of your grasp. But yeah, it's, it'll be an excellent goal if it's 500 points and you generally get 450. Look, I'm really going to try and push myself for those last 50 points. Uh, why not? And and yeah, believe it and you can achieve it. Isn't that the famous mantra? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Something about seeing it written down as well. Like it's, when it's in your mind, it doesn't seem real. But if you see it on the page, you're like, actually, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> has a huge effect. You know, that's what they say. They say if you write your, your goals down or say start saying them out loud, uh, you're statistically more likely to achieve those goals. So, yeah, even getting it down your CEO saying, you know, this is uh, an opportunity for me now. Motivation and CEO tips we are giving the listeners a bag for their book with this episode. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Tony Robbins, watch out. And <laughs> um, the next thing I'll ask you is um, something that you definitely get a lot. And I'd say people are really specific in like, oh, do you think this course is likely to go up in points or do you, what's like what the points will be for this year? And I was actually <laughs> re- researching before this podcast, what are the most asked questions about the CAO? And it is points. It's like, will it go up? Will it go down? And when we had you on to do the videos with Aoife, you had a really good explanation for how the points work because it can be confusing and people, they don't, it's never really explained to them. So can you explain how the points work yeah. every year? How they go You're up right. and down? You're it's, right. It's really confusing. There's so much people think they need to know um, about the CEO. And, and the way points work is, because often I used to think that it was universities setting a benchmark that if you don't get over 450 points, 
you're not going to get this course. But that's not how it works. So say, for example, a course has 20 places. The person who gets the first place on that will be the person who applied for the course and got the most amount of CEO points. So maybe the first person who gets that place has 600 points. The second place is given to the person who's applied for the course who got the second most amount of points. And we fill up all those 20 places right down through the points of those who've applied for the course. And the 20th place, because we've only got 20 places in our course, that's uh, the points. The person who got in on that 20th place, say they were 20 down the list, maybe they got 450 points. That's what the points are going to be for that course, 450 points. So it means the very last person who got a place on that course, that's how many points they got. So when you see the points in the newspaper, the day of the offers, that's what that means. Never knew that. I went through all of school and I never knew that. It's just crazy that that information is. Yeah, you're just told like it has to be high for this for the most popular courses. And I just, yeah, it never came to me. I just accepted that. Of course, that, all the yeah. medicine students are getting <laughs> 65. Well, a lot of the, the most popular courses actually have a small amount of places. Like if you look at some of the top courses in Trinity and UCD, they all only have about 20, 25 places. Where if you look at actually the most popular uh, course on the CEO, so the most applied for course in the CEO and the most first preferences is actually mm. arts in Maynooth University. And that's only, it was only 318 points last year. And it's because they have mm. 1,500 places. Wow. So that's why the points are quite low. Uh, so often it can be misleading. You can kind of see the amount of places on a course maybe will tell you that it's probably going to be very popular. And that this might be like a scary hypothetical, but hypothetically, could a, with that in mind, like a course could go up by like a hundred points, say if like people who yeah, applied for it got yeah. all six over six hundred, kind of a thing. So yeah, and and that's happened, you know, a good few. Like it does happen regularly. Like say during the recession here in Ireland, points for engineering courses went down an awful lot because nobody wanted that kind of construction industry, say civil engineering and things like that. So points went down a lot and then have creeped back up the last few years. Generally, when, when the economy is uncertain, the courses where you have, where you're qualified in something at the end of it, where you have a career at the end of it, start to get really high. Yeah. Um, the likes of dentistry, the likes of nursing, the likes of teaching, where you're guaranteed your career when you come out of it. The points for those generally go up when, when the market, the economy is not stable. And then when it is stable, you start to see the likes of arts and things like that uh, start to go higher and higher where people want to pursue what they really like rather than looking for a career so it's interesting that makes when you see the late when you see the labor market trends it's really interesting that is wow. interesting there was another thing i was going to ask on that note that say like if you wanted to do nursing in ucc is there a way that you can see the patterns of the points down through the years to know what the average is is there a way of finding that out or looking it up. Yeah, so qualifax.ie um it's brilliant. So qualifax.ie is a is a state run uh, website for leaving search students and it's it's really excellent. But no matter what course you look up, it gives you a huge amount of detail and it'll also show you the points for the last three years. And the last three years is probably significant enough. You don't really need to delve back into the last 10, 15 years. Right. The last three years will give you a better idea. Um, but Qualifax study, if you look up any course in that, at the very end of all the detail, you'll see the points from the last few years. Excellent. Qualifax is definitely one to be bookmarked for six year students. Yeah, I think so. Like it has, it's not, it's not a flash website. It's very, it's literally a white background and black writing on it a lot, but it's so informative. I can understand, like I love it, but I've guidance counselors, friends who really don't like it. They prefer careers portal maybe. All right. But I just think Qualifax is just a matter of fact. And I loved just getting straight to the no point. No messing. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so, you know, let's, we've kind of been talking about students there that know what they want to do, if they know that they have nursing mind or whatever. But I imagine a lot of students and definitely myself and Nessa, when we were at that stage in school, would have been the same, that we have no idea. And maybe at this point kind of feel under pressure. Okay, the heat is on now. I need to get my act together, but I still haven't a clue what to put down or where to look what what would you recommend to the lost souls yeah there's there's loads of things when i when i meet the lost souls um the first question i would ask them is what subject do you love in school and why do you love that subject what is it about it that you like and then i'll say what subject do you hate in school and they generally have one to dislike and why do you dislike that so then we'll start to look at subjects where 
they have similar trends to the subject you do like. And so say they absolutely hate maths. Well, I'm not going to start looking at science courses and data science and computer science, engineering, where there's a huge amount of maths. We'll tend to stay away from that. And if they love things like history, okay, well, let's look at some arts courses or, uh, you know, sometimes history students love law and things like that. So they're more kind of verbal uh, orientated degrees rather than numerical. So that's kind of what I tend to do. I tend to say to students, try not to focus on what your career is going to be at the end. Lots of students, if I ever mention an arts degree, they'll say, well, what can I do at the end of that? There's lots of things you can do. It's not like there's a massive uh, queue of arts graduates on the unemployment line um, outside social welfare offices. That's that's not the case. There's hugely transferable skills that you can get from an arts degree that lots of employers are looking for. Maybe you studied a language. Maybe you studied politics, economics as part of your, of your arts. And they have massive transferable skills like problem solving, critical thinking, communication, presentation skills, teamwork skills. And then they'll probably take you into a graduate program and say, okay, you've learned these skills in college. We want you to have our applicants to have a level eight degree. But now we're, this is kind of what we want to add to your skill set. Um, so I always say if you're really passionate about something, like I loved history in school. But a lot of people just said to me, well, you're going to become a history teacher. Yeah. Now, I, I did become a history <laughs> teacher, but there, are, <laughs> there were people on my degrees who, who ended up not becoming history teachers. There's so many um like a good friend of mine from the degree he runs a senator's office here in ireland and, and, and stuff like that so like, there's loads of opportunities um from from different degrees but i always say focus on what you're really passionate about um and try not to f- figure out what the career is going to be i love the the do you know charlie Maskey started doing these um paintings with a horse mm, a boy mm-hmm. and a fox you know this one mm. and he had a really good one the other day where the boy said i can't see where we're going and the horse said, well, can you see your next step? And the boy said, yes. I said, just take that. Uh, and I put that exactly the same with students as well. Try not to focus too far down the line. See what the next step is going to be. Try not to worry about the career. Yeah, I love I think, that. I think we talked about that in the last podcast as well, because I, I was saying that for me personally, it's always like just focus on a point in the future where it, it's no longer a worry for you. And then you came back with something similar like that and... I think it was yeah. because after you had kids that it was a lot easier to just focus on the here and now. Yeah. So I suppose it, it depends on your own world view. But I think that one actually does make more sense in kind of thinking into the future where everything, is, especially now with the pandemic, everything is so uncertain. Just putting one foot in front of the other and getting the next step ahead of you is definitely enough. Mm. And the adventure is great. Like you don't need to know at 18. You don't need to have your life laid out for you. The adventure is great in kind of not knowing what you're going to do. But just take each step as it comes. Yeah. yeah, and I think right. nowadays, like, I think before, and especially I'd say a lot of parents would maybe be projecting this onto their the current students and their children, um, because in their day it was, you know, you do one job and that's it for life. Whereas exactly. I think students yeah. nowadays do need to realize that you can change jobs 20 times before you retire. And that's completely fine. And that's completely realistic uh, in today's world so you don't have to freak out about trying to find a job that's perfect for you right away you have loads of time third level education is a lot more accessible than it was so you could go back to college if you don't find the right thing straight away that there's no huge pressure to find the perfect thing right now it's very hard to find your passion at 18 like exactly and, and the, the degree the undergraduate degree you're going to do is the, it's really the foundation of lifelong learning that you're going to do yeah. like i've done three masters since I left college and you know and and that's and and none of them paid me anymore (laughs) and if I didn't do them so uh, they cost me a lot of money but uh but it is it's it's and I I ended up loving college I wasn't overly mad about school but I loved college I loved third level and right up to my last one that I did I absolutely loved it um and that's the way you see your degree it's only the start of where you're going to go yeah that's it that's great advice yeah, I love that. Focus on, don't focus on the career because it's like the next three or four years. That's what you're going to be doing. So look at the courses and really think about what is your interest and does that course, is this something you'll enjoy doing for three or four years? That's so important. Yeah, and, and there's there's so many jobs now today that weren't even invented five years yeah. ago. Yeah. Um, like I know a transition year student uh, last year who got work experience because she wrote down in her CV, 
that she was really skilled in all types of social media. Mm. And the company she applied for were actually really keen on that skill. Even though she just knew how to upload on Instagram, Facebook, <laughs> TikTok, whatever. The company had these social media outlets and platforms and didn't know how to use them. So they literally brought her in for a week and said, just over throw our whole social media platform and, and do what you can do. And so young people have a lot more skills than they think that they have. Like you, I, I think more transitioners, most transitioners wouldn't put down that they're, you know, really skilled at social media when they are. Yeah. Um, so you have more skills than you think you have. And that's what I mean. So jobs that weren't like, there was no social media managers five years ago. So by the time you finish your degree, there could be so many jobs that yeah. weren't even in existence when you started your degree. Yeah, you there was no, <laughs> there was no study clicks podcast. That was five years ago, but <laughs> look at us now. <laughs> Thriving. Well, do you know there was there was no Google when I was in college? Would you believe? How that? did you survive? <laughs> How did you learn? Yeah. How did you get from A yeah. to B? <laughs> Would you believe I I read books? What are books? <laughs> yeah, all of the world. You read books. That's over. Google was like two thousand and six. Uh, I think I finished my my degree in two thousand six. That's not that We'll, let, we'll let our <laughs> listeners guess your age. <laughs> yeah. Do the maths yourself there. <laughs> Uh, that's why I was thinking when you were saying that I have a friend who works in a li- uh, pretty high up in a, in a library but she's one of the youngest members of staff and they have her as their marketing genius because she knows how to upload a <laughs> Facebook photo right, this, is, yeah. this is Sive she's the marketing whiz so like it depends yeah. on where you're working you could be considered a genius just from the generation that you were brought up in absolutely and it is a skill because you see now, even with the pandemic, everything has gone online now. Everything is online. School is online. Retail is online. Everything's online. So it's if you have that skill, and most people don't, most people of a certain generation don't. Uh, so really consider yourself quite skillful in certain areas. Mm. And I think young people do tend to say, well, you know, I'm not really good at anything. I haven't done anything yet. You're more skilled than you think you are. Absolutely. That's good. I hope that's life affirming for the people because I know it can be so stressful. Like on top of everything else, people are yeah, and relatives would be asking you as well, like, "Oh, what do you want to do after school?" And like, I don't know. Please stop asking. Yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah, it's the worst time of year for it as well. It's like the time of year that that's all your relatives ask you. Oh, do you know what you're doing yet? Yeah. <laughs> You'd nearly be dreading going to yeah. the communions. You'd oh nearly be God. glad they aren't on at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Some of my some of my most interesting friends are in their forties and still don't know what they want to do. You know, I always think people who don't want to know are really interesting people. Mm, it's funny. Anyway, um, so we're talking there about different. I, I suppose we focus there a bit on third level and you know the joys of college and all that, but that's not the only option, obviously. And I know on our last podcast when we had John Donica, we talked a good bit about PLCs and how fantastic they can be. So we won't talk too much about it because we've already done a bit on it but maybe just a quick refresher on if 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 you're thinking of a plc at this point what what are your next steps well the plc open days virtual open days start now more or less kind of the end of january um so if you want to apply for a plc you po- apply directly to the college of further education themselves it's not done through ceo and so many people get confused in that say i can't find the plc section in the ceo oh. it's a different application apply directly to the college of further education uh, now simon harris does want to put that all under the one umbrella and uh, where you can apply for apprenticeships and plcs and college all in the one so we'll see how that goes but um yeah so it's now you would do it they do interview you. You could actually apply for it as a backup option. You could be offered a place in the course. You could accept it. I don't tell list of many principles in College of Further Education, but come August, if you do get your choice that you want in university, you could say, actually, I'm not going to take that place. So, you know, there's always that opportunity as well. It's a good plan B for some people. It's a good plan A for some people. Some people don't want college. They want to be skilled in something where they could take a job straight afterwards. Mm. PLCs are good for that. PLCs are also good for... A different entry route into college. Like I think about 4,000 QQI applicants, that's what they're called, uh, applied to the CEO last year and got offered places. So it's another entry route into third level as well. Okay. And I think it, like tying into our last point about if you don't know what you want to do yet, it's it's also a good option for that, that you could just, if you're not, if you don't want to waste a year in college not knowing what you want to do, you can just do that for a year and see are you interested in, in one of the PLC options. Absolutely. Um, I always say that because you'll do work experience in, in the area um, that you're thinking about doing. 
like I know people have done lab techniques and, and PLCs and, and figured out God science is not for me mm. um, or did nursing and then did a work experience that, well, that's definitely not for me so you're absolutely right um, because I have a good friend of mine who did primary school teaching for four years and qualified in six weeks into his first job he said this job isn't for me <laughs> oh, uh, so he left it and, and, and went to, to run a nightclub um, <laughs> Which is very different right. from, from primary school teaching, <laughs> yeah. But so so it does, it gives you that option to try it for a year and not kind of, as you were saying, waste four years almost doing a degree that you're not sure about. Um, and I always think it's a brilliant transition year from second level to third level because it's a huge jump mm. and it's a really different jump. Mm. You know, it's there's so much independent learning in third level that you don't really have in second level. And it equips you with the skills, how to write essays, how to do presentations, all of these different things. Um, that you don't learn in secondary school that would be very valuable for third level. Yeah, it can be quite overwhelming otherwise. We definitely need to big up PLCs so much more. I felt like they've got such a bad rap when I was in school. It's like, oh, if you don't do well in the leaving cert, you'll have to do a PLC. But like, they sound amazing. That shouldn't be like a bad thing. They, they sound really class, to be fair. And I know a student of mine previously did an animal science uh, PLC. She didn't want to go to college, didn't like college, um, didn't like the idea of it. And part of her animal science PLC was dog grooming. And she loved it so much <laughs> that her and her mum opened a dog grooming parlour after she finished her PLC. That's amazing. That's so yeah. cool. And like, I think the the thing that stood out for me there um, was like work experience and finding out whether you like it or not, because that rings true so much for me. I remember in TY, uh, we had two weeks of work experience where you chose two different places to go to. And for my first week, I went to this, uh, I was I loved home ec so like I was kind of following your advice what do you love in school and I loved home ec so I was like I need to be a nutritional scientist and I went to this lab where they were I think it was baby food they were making or something like that and I was testing I was in some lab I had to put on I think four different Hamza suits half my day was putting on suits and taking off suits and then I spent the day just sitting in this tiny little lab putting teeny pieces of powder on the weighing scales and seeing how much protein was in it or whatever I can't remember now what it was but I hated it. I absolutely hated it. And I was like, thank God I had this nightmare of a week so that I didn't have to have a nightmare of a life <laughs> when I did my nutritional science course and hated it for the rest of my life. So there's so much value in getting work experience if you're not sure yet that that's like, if you're not sure what you're applying for in college is really for you. Consider the PLC and think, can I just have a year of it to get a feel for it instead of committing to it for a longer period of time? You're absolutely right. And I always say to students, if you hated your work experience, put it down as a positive mm. because I know that's not for me. So I always say work experience, if you don't like it, is just as good as finding a work experience you don't like or you do like because you just, OK, that's off my list. I know that's not for me. Yeah. OK, so PLCs we have covered third year or third level um, institutions we have covered and as part of third level, but kind of a separate thing that some people will be looking at. And a lot of study clips users tend to do this is the HPAT. Um, so I know we have would have a couple of people always asking, you know, tips or at what point do they have to start doing things if they want to get into medicine and all that. So can you give us sort of a, a quick summary of the top things to know if you're thinking of doing the HPAT or thinking of going down the medicine route? Yeah, so 20th of January was the deadline date for the early bird fee of €152.80. <laughs> and so they take applicants, yes, it's very specific. <laughs> they do take applicants up until the 1st of February, but if you apply between the 20th of January and the 1st of February, it's going to cost you 70 euro more. And then they have an extra late application date from the 1st of February to the 5th of February. And I think that is about 110 euro more. Um, oh, sorry. And it's, it's actually on the, the 20th and 21st of February this year. It's uh, all online this year. A lot of rules. If you're applying for it, make sure you've read the HBAT 2021 book. There's loads of rules. And, you know, a lot of little things could get you in big trouble. Like they could say, you know, your exam is void if you do a couple of little things that you're not supposed to do. So check out the rules for this year because okay. it's very different okay. than, than most other years because it's online this year. And, and that book is available online as well, is it? The HPAT book? Yeah, it's on the HPAT. If you just type in HPAT Ireland, okay. uh, it'll bring you straight to the website and, and that book that'll be there. It's not even a long read. I think it's like four or five pages long. So Very good. And what happens for people, let's say they get to April and they decide, oh, I've only just now realised that medicine for me is the only route for them, either something along the PLC route and then do it next year or just to wait until next year? Is there any options for people who realise later on? 
So you'd be surprised the amount of students who actually take the year out to focus on the HBAT. In my first year, I'm going to focus on the Leave Insert. And I'm going to throw, try and get 600 points. And with that 600 points, I know I'm going to have to get 180 points in the HPAT. So I'm just going to focus on the leave insert here. I'm going to take the year out next year. And I'm going to focus on the HPAT. I know I have to get in the top 10 percentile or 20 percentile. And that's my focus. So people are quite shrewd about it. And they, they really are calculated in how they're going to approach it. And they don't mind having to use that extra year. Because doing the leave insert mm. and the HPAT all in the one year is very stressful, is very tough. Um, it's essentially a, an eight subject um, and some people who are doing apply for medicine already do eight subjects so it's essentially a ninth subject then um, so I, I like people who are shrewd about it and don't mind having to put in that extra year but yeah that's what you'd have to do if come April you didn't do it you'd have to wait until the HPAT because the HPAT is only you can only do the HPAT the year you're going to start medicine so you couldn't decide okay. to do it this year in February and say, no, I'm going to apply in September 2022. So you can't do that. It has to be the year oh, uh, you're, right. you're going to apply for. That for is medicine. useful That's information. Yeah. OK. Um, all right. That was all of our kind of our, our general questions. I put the question box up on Instagram to see if anyone just had any of their own, maybe more specific questions that they wanted to ask. So. I might just fire those at you now, Tonica, if that's all right. So uh, the first question is, if an entry requirement is described as recommend, does that mean the colleges and or the CEO check if you got the recommended grade as well as the required points? I think it's just to make life easier for yourself um, in college. Like I know veterinary medicine in UCD ask you to have chemistry. That is your requirement. But it's recommended that you do biology as well. You don't have to have biology, but it's recommended. And it just means life will be easier for you on the course if you have leave insert biology as well as leave insert chemistry. But no, you don't actually have to have it. It's just recommended that you have it. Okay, perfect. Um, another question is progression routes from level seven, etc. Is it possible to go from a level seven to UCD commerce? Uh, yes, it would be, yeah. Um, what year you would go into, I don't know. You'd have to contact ucd and ask them but yeah it absolutely is like you could be doing a level six or seven in a completely different college and then decide i actually want to switch over to ucd or wherever you want to go um yes if there's a place on the course for you you would contact the program director or the yeah and they would try and make a place for you if there is a place there uh so was this person talking about business business i think would be fine but where there's courses where there's a certain amount of people for health and safety reasons could be a lot more difficult. Um, so if it's like a science course or something where they can only have 25 there, that might be a bit trickier if nobody has dropped out. But I think for business, yeah, it should be fine. Okay, a few more questions we got. Um, this person asked, and it might it might seem like there is an obvious answer, but you might be able to give more um, details on various different arts courses that there are. And this person asked, I want to be a biology and a Spanish teacher is there any way to do that? Well, that's a tricky one, all right, yeah. Um, is there any way to do that? Not off the top of my head, there isn't. I know in the likes of Trinity, uh, you can keep up a language as a module. Whether that ends up as a major, minor degree, I'm not too sure. That's a, Spanish and, and biology would be a tricky one to put together. Would you have to do, could, would you be able to do one as your bachelor and one as your master's? You could, yeah, you could. Uh then you'd have to do a two-year PME as well, so the Professional Master's in Education. So that would essentially take you eight years to become a biology and Spanish teacher. Okay, so you, w- you wouldn't be able to do it's a PME worth plus <laughs> a language, for example, or anything? All in the same two years? No, you'd, you'd probably have to do a postgrad at least okay. in it. And the teaching council have to... So say you did your science, the teaching council has to see that you've done a certain amount in your modules to warrant becoming a Leave Insert teacher in that subject. Um, like most subjects like biology is put together with PE and DCU it's put together with maths and VCU um, be the same in Maynooth University with science education it's generally biology maths um, so putting the language together would be tricky but there's probably ways around it but not off the top of my head I can't think okay um, th- that was all the questions from um, Instagram so I think that's it unless Emer, did you have any last minute questions that you thought of there no I don't know that, well my question is can we go back six years ago and <laughs> have Donica <laughs> as my career guidance I'd love to know where I would be today if I had like <laughs> had a decent career guidance career guidance teacher 
to tell me what I should do with my life. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's, it's so different now. Like one of the first questions students would ask me when they come in for an appointment is, they would they would ask about Erasmus and study abroad. That's that's the big ones they always ask. You know, where can I go um, with this degree? Like a lot of students want to study in America, but realize how expensive it is. So, so expensive. They would, yeah. they would often pick courses that would give you the opportunity to study for a year over there, where you don't have to pay the massive fees. So Erasmus and study abroad is a big thing now as well. I know Trinity College are trying to get their the amount of students every year that go on a study abroad to, to up to 50%. They actually have it at 44% now, which mm-hmm. is amazing. Um, so Erasmus is studying in Europe and study abroad is, is anywhere outside of Europe. And Erasmus, you actually get paid while you're on your Erasmus. You don't get paid. It's kind of like a grant. So you get like between 290 euro and 390 euro a month, depending on um, depending on what country yeah. you go to. Emer, you did Erasmus, did you? Yeah, I remember getting that grant, but they they sent it all in one go at the start, oh, and nice. I was so broke at the start that I just <laughs> spent it all in the in the first month, and then had nothing else for to keep me going for the other four months that I was there. But yeah, and was it? priority for you knowing where you were going to go in Erasmus uh, it was definitely a big part of choosing that choosing my course that I could go abroad because I knew I wanted to go abroad and I knew I liked languages um so I and it was always kind of between UCC and UL for me and I chose UL in the end because they had two abroad options you know you have your working abroad and then studying abroad whereas UCC only had the one studying abroad and that's it um so I went for UL in the end because they had the the two options and I'm glad I did in the end but yeah, it was definitely a huge part for me to to know that I could go abroad. So you, I'm always surprised. It always really surprises me, um, how how that students, a lot of students, pick their courses based on where the study abroad opportunity. And I think that's brilliant. You know, if that's something you really want to do, absolutely go for it. Like I know Trinity has some partnership with University of Berkeley in California. And like a student said to me recently, like imagine getting to stay a winter in California. Like how nice would that be? Mm, I was like, yeah, yeah. yeah, places like San Diego. I know a lot of universities uh, that have partnerships in DCU as well. We have partnership with San Diego. It can be a lovely winter to be spending in San Diego. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's a big thing at the minute as well. So yeah, research that if that's if that's something you're really into. And I I would say if you haven't considered study abroad a lot or is sort of these international opportunities that you can get with with courses definitely look into it it's such an amazing experience if even if you don't think i know loads of people who would have considered themselves maybe home birds and then would have never would have avoided courses like that or specifically chosen courses that don't go abroad because they're afraid of it but i would say never dismiss anything like that always consider it look into it because it's such a great experience to go abroad and just have that experience in another country it really Gives you a different view, Absolutely. and even some universities, you 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 could have the option of only doing a semester, which might suit some people more. That yeah. doesn't have to be the full year. Um, so even look into that if you if you're a bit intimidated by it, you'd like to go for a short time, not a full year. Some universities and colleges offer semesters, which might suit you better. Exactly. Sounds great. On that point, I might bring up and remind people again that we did do a series of videos with you that we recorded over the summer under various different categories to do with career guidance and the CAO. So one of them was about study abroad. And if you were looking to do go to a, a university in another country, how do you go about that? And there was another one about career guidance for a pandemic, for the times that we're living in. And we're going to be... Re- and we, when we recorded that, actually, we thought it wasn't going to be hugely relevant. I know, I was like, yeah, yeah. very. this will only be for 2020. And then the, yeah, the minute yeah. it turns 2021, it will be gone. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we'll be releasing more videos on YouTube so be sure to subscribe to Study Clicks' YouTube channel so you can keep up to date on those and they're brilliant videos as well yeah um, otherwise Donica do you want to give us uh, another recap of where students can find you and what they can expect yeah so leave us our guidance on Instagram and leave us our guidance podcast and the podcast is uh, I was saying you're right it's it's not because of me is why I think it's great because I don't actually have much input in the podcast I just kind of ask questions but we always have brilliant guests on it. Um, and I think it will be really beneficial for students who are researching different courses. Like we had DCU a couple of weeks ago and they're bringing out five new courses in September 2021. And, and they're so innovative, these courses. It's actually really interesting and, and might kind of sway uh, some students over to DCU with what they're bringing out. And, and it's not just DCU. Every college, uh, higher education institute that we have on always have something brilliant to offer 
uh, that I I'm always gobsmacked by by the information I get as well. Um, so definitely check out the podcast. I always I love doing the episodes because I learn so much as well from doing them too. So check that That's out as brilliant. well. Brilliant. That's so beneficial to people who, like we discussed, might know what they want to do if they to really in depth look at different courses and new ones that they mightn't even have thought existed. Yeah. Absolutely. I think especially because you always, you know, you hear of your siblings or, you know, people are trying to influence you to do the traditional courses that everyone knows about. Um, that I always felt like I never really knew any of the new courses or if I looked at them just in the newspaper, wherever they would have popped up, I'm like, okay, I don't know what that is. So I'm just not going to consider it. So actually definitely worthwhile listening to information like that about new courses. Now that you say it, just new courses, you can get them on the CAO alert list. So if you just type in CEO alert list, mm. it shows all the new courses and some of the courses actually aren't in the CEO handbook for this year. And those courses generally, you know, generally, don't quote me on this, are lower on points um, the first year because they're not in the CEO handbook and nobody's really known about them than they would be in subsequent years. So you could be ahead of the curve there. If you check out CEO alert list, all the different higher education institutes that have new courses coming out. Uh, will be on that and you might find a little gem mm, a bit of a CEO hack there yeah <laughs> exactly there's a little tip for you amazing um, I might just give our little spiel as I always do if you're still listening um, if you're not following Study Clicks as well on all of our social media platforms we're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram and now TikTok we have a team of four people on TikTok now so it's super fun you should follow us over there and um, if you have time, we would really appreciate a rate and review if you listen to us on Apple Podcasts, only if it's nice. If I see anything <laughs> negative, I will cry because I'm very bad at taking criticism. <laughs> but um, Constructive criticism we can constructive take. Constructive criticism, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't even take constructive criticism. <laughs> <laughs> if, if it's anything slightly negative, I don't want to hear it. Forward it all to Emer. At- <laughs> <laughs> I can take it, just don't send it to Nessa. Um. yeah so as Nessa said do try and give us a review if you have time at a rating we would love that and otherwise we'll be back very soon with some more podcasts we're hoping to get other lovely guests on like Donica and I'm sure we'll hear from Donica again once um, more deadlines come up in a couple of months so do not fear <laughs> we'll have him back again <laughs> Absolutely. no I always love coming on to the podcast it's always very chill and it's a nice chat Um, and it's nice to, to just have a nice little chat and I, I always love podcasts where you always feel like you're just overhearing the person's conversation. I love a podcast like that. And this is what this feels like. <laughs> that's right. I hope that's how people feel. Yeah. And it's so great to have this expert information. I just think I genuinely feel like, God, I'd be so happy to be a student and hear this. It's just so valuable and straight up and no nonsense. Yeah. yeah. No. And I, uh, yeah. And I'm kind of a no nonsense person. I get straight to the facts. But I suppose, if, you know, sometimes guidance counselors get a rough a rough image because a lot of their job now is actually counseling. There's very little time to give career guidance. And most guidance counselors I know are like teaching half a timetable as well as trying to counsel students who are suffering from different mental health issues and then trying to give career advice on top. But I'm very lucky in my school where where I do have the opportunity to, you know, do a lot of career guidance, but not everybody's in that position. So, you know, kind of cut them some slack if you can they're, they're generally really busy and it's more on the pastoral side of things that they're probably really busy with um, and that's probably why you can't access them but they are very hard to access all right yeah okay we will we'll do our best to be a bit more kind <laughs> to, the, to the career guidance counselors have you future. asked your career guidance counselor how they are today <laughs> <laughs> um Perfect. Okay, well, Donica, thank you so much. We'll cut it off there at the risk of it Thanks, being guys. too long. Thanks, Enjoyed thanks, that. thanks thank a you. million, Donica. Bye.